Barney Barnes, father of six and husband to Martha Barnes, was found in a creek on the outskirts of Conecuh National Forest, Alabama. His carcass had been mangled, and from what forensic investigators could tell, what was left of him had sat in the creek for approximately four days. A group of campers discovered his remains while fishing and discovered his lost tape, which held his last words. I invite you to join me on this Lost Tapes episode, a prelude for the Church of Sin. Look, I'll be honest with y'all. The only reason I went out camping in Kanaka Forest was because the government told me not to. Well, actually, the mother-in-law was in town, and I'd rather have my foot gnawed off by a bobcat than listen to her any longer than I needed to. She's been yammering on for months about finding a better job, and now that she didn't have one, she decided to move in with us. Didn't have much to say in that matter. She just showed up at our doorstep, so I said screw it. Real tired of people telling me what to do, where to go, who to see, and what I can't do. So so you bet that when I read in the Andalusia Chronicle that the FBI was telling people to stay out of the forest, I was a bit intrigued. When the forest rangers and whatnot started kicking people out, I became very interested. And once they started talking about shutting the park down, I decided now was as good a time as any to get some good old camping in. With regards to the government, man, we know the government is lying to us. You can only say fetch and pretend to throw the ball so many times before you stop looking for the ball. So, since the government imposed all these restrictions, I saw now as good a time as any to venture into the woods. Ain't gonna be anyone else out there, and let's be realistic. Man are hiding in the woods? People with gray robes? Come on, man. That's someone's, like, loony toony nonsense right there. Pretty sure the people who believe in that crap are the same people who engage in flat earth circle jerks whenever the retard convention rolls into town. Anyway, I packed up my things, left my phone at home, brought this here tape recorder, and one night in the fall, I saw something. There was this one guy tracing my footsteps. One key detail that struck differently with the homicide investigation of Barry Barnes is that his entire body was discovered. Typically, with these sorts of cases, there's usually shreds of a person found, but in this case, there was enough of his body intact that forensic investigators could tell that he had been strangulated with a rope around his neck. He still had something resembling neck rope burns. Stranger than that, he was concealed in a body bag that had been sealed shut with a padlock, and it is believed that he died by drowning. A note had been discovered on his body, a note allegedly from the Church of Sin, but this note was debunked by the Church of Sin conspiracy community on the grounds that the author of the note misspelled the word sin in the Church of Sin. The spelling was as such, S-I-N and not S-Y-N. Not only was the misspelling an indication that the Church of Sin was being used as a scapegoat, the content of the letter also raised many eyebrows in the conspiracy theory group. The letter read, We had extinguished Barry Barnes because we are the Church of Sin and we are a church of sinners. We worship the devil and await the return of the Antichrist. We have committed tax evasion, identity theft, and run a pyramid scheme in Andalusia, Alabama. We steal cats and dogs and sell them on the black market. We are gluttonous and indulge in every lustful thought which crosses our minds. We sacrifice Barry to Satan and request no further investigation, as we are solely responsible for his demise. There is no need to investigate anyone else other than us. Though the difference in spelling between S-Y-N and S-I-N had become a rumor originating from another lost tape provided by someone who read the Church of Sin's Bible, the blatant sense of self-accountability, pride, and devotion to Satan was interpreted as someone who was trying to convince whoever found Barney that he was the newest victim of the Church of Sin. The lead detective of the homicide investigation, David Wilbrook, knew that the Church of Sin, if it really existed to this point, had never taken ownership for the disappearances in the Kanaka National Forest, nor did it announce that it was a religion which followed Satan. As far as he or anyone else knew, their religious beliefs, what they did, and who they worshipped was a mystery. 
No one knew if sin was a person, place, thing, belief, or a god. In another lost tape, the individual who discovered the Bible spoke of it briefly and mentioned the origin of the name Sin and indicated that it was the truncated form of Sinclair. But even that, the Bible, or anything to support that claim, had yet to be discovered. Everything surrounding the mythology of the Church of Sin was just that, a myth. Considering the unique nature in which Barry was discovered, and the handwritten letter, and the egregious attempt to frame the Church of Sin, Detective David had the strong suspicion that whoever killed Barry knew him well enough to find him in the forest. Once Barry's wife cashed his $2 million life insurance check, she became the primary suspect in her husband's murder. I looked at that man and I started to run. Fool was horribly out of shape and he was gasping. I studied him closer and noticed this fool was wearing a dark gray bathrobe. A bathrobe. A freaking bathrobe. From what I can remember, these cultists I've been hearing so much about wore something resembling hooded cloaks. You could call them robes, sure, but I know for sure they were not running around stalking people in bathrobes. I chuckled as I ran, and then the guy withdrew a knife. Oh, jeez. I guess he's not joking. I darted through the forest, and somehow we came upon a manor. I made enough distance between him and myself as he started to lag behind. Now I'm starting to wonder if he's trying to move through the swamp wearing slippers, you know, seeing how he's wearing a bathrobe and all. But anyways, I saw this huge manor, and I, I think I've heard about this before. I looked at the thing, and... There ain't no one inside. No lights on. Place looks overgrown with moss. I kept running, and then I saw what looked like, like, uh, tan sheets hanging out on a laundry line. I turned around and saw that I had mostly lost the guy. He'll catch up with me eventually, but in the meantime, I inched closer to the manor. If the Church of Sin is real, well then, maybe they'll see the guy who's trying to pose as one of them and be offended. I don't know. But anyway, the closer I got to the clothesline, the more I started to think that those tan things hanging on the lines, uh, they weren't sheets or clothing at all. It was human skin hung out to dry. Once his wife had cashed the life insurance check, she purchased a modest home and then reported to the police that her boyfriend had been missing. Detective David took up this missing person case as Martha's boyfriend had coincidentally disappeared at the same time Barry did, and one could imagine where her boyfriend's last known location was, Kaneka National Forest. There's an old saying, a fool and her money are soon parted. In less than three days from receiving her life insurance check, Martha had purchased three new vehicles, one for her, one for the new love of her life, which was lost in the forest, and one for her mother. She purchased too many things too quickly, and as a result, David noticed that her new home had become more and more lavish with every visit he made. Leather couches, 80-inch televisions, crystal vases, a $6,000 teacup poodle, and diamond-studded jewelry which were now adorned on her neck, wrists, and ears. In Martha's world, she had finally earned the life she felt she deserved. David kept quiet, though, as he knew where her boyfriend was. His clothing and bones had been found, and it appeared he had met the same fate many others had with regards to the Church of Sin. He was dead, and in his pocket was a love letter from Martha, and barely legible handwriting outlining her plan for her husband's demise. I ran past those curtains of skin and grabbed a few rocks. The man pursuing me returned from the forest. I threw those rocks right in the house and then someone sat up. A thin man with a bull haircut. His face was red. I ducked low into the grass and he saw the man pursuing me. I think it worked. I scurried away from there and toward the forest, but my pursuer eventually caught up with me and now I know I'm not going to get through this. I stood up and I ran as fast as I could, but the man is chasing me. I stood up and ran as fast as I could, but that man is still chasing me. The other man, the guy with the haircut, he noticed I'm being chased and he backed off. 
I don't understand what these two are on about, but either way, I can't run forever. And now, there's two people on my trail. But even still, this weirdo is still chasing me, and the weirdo is being followed. So either it's this guy is going to end me, or the Church of Sin is going to end me. Either way, I'm doomed, and you know what? I really don't care anymore. If this guy wants me dead, well then, I can only assume my wife had something to do with it. I know she's been messing around lately, but I don't care anymore. Whatever. I believe in reincarnation, so y you know what? When I reincarnate, I'm going to be a beetle. A dung beetle. What do they have to worry about? Well, nothing. He's getting closer now. He's got the knife out, and so... Whatever. Goodbye, I guess. Martha was arrested two weeks after she had cashed her life insurance policy check and charged for the murder of her husband. She was sentenced to 45 years in prison, and though she pleaded that she spent nearly all of the money because of her grief, the jury remained firm in their conviction. Now, about her boyfriend. Aside from his clothes, he has yet to be discovered. As far as the Church of Sin conspiracy group is concerned, he is their newest victim. Detective David had deduced that in Barry's final moments, there was a struggle which resulted in Barry becoming unconscious. There were signs of blunt force trauma to the top of his skull and bruising across his face, though the autopsy indicated that these could have been factors which led to his death, they were not in fact the cause of his death. Because of this, David surmised that Barry's assailant had rendered Barry unconscious, mangled him, placed him into the body bag, planted the evidence, zipped up the bag, sealed it with a padlock, and dragged him to a creek, where he could then be whisked away by the water. Since Barry was unconscious, he drowned in the creek. As for his assailant, David deduced that if the information on the lost tape was true, then it was likely that the bold, haircut man waited until there was a good time to strike and then struck once Barry had been disposed of. If the mythology of the Church of Sin was accurate, David assumed that that particular member of the church should have retrieved Barry's carcass, but for some reason unknown, he refused to do so. Because of this case, the intrigue of the Church of Sin mellowed down and eventually fell into obscurity.